Hi, I'm Rhett Butler, and I'm the founder and CEO of MangaBay. Today, I'm speaking with Jonathan Ayers, a board member for Panthera, the Global Wildcat Conservation Group, uh, and a member of the Global Alliance for Wildcat Conservation. Rhett, great to speak with you. I'm very interested in learning more about your relationship with Panthera and why you're uh, so interested in, in working with, with uh, cats. So, I mean, to get started, uh, what inspired your interest in wildcats? Well, um, Rhett, I've always been a cat guy. Uh, I love cats. Uh, my relationship with cats, of course, has been domestic cats. Uh, and I also uh, love nature and I appreciate nature. I have a biology uh, background and I understand and appreciate you know, complex ecosystems. And so, uh, you know, one day I asked, well, I love cats, I love nature. What kind of cats are in nature? And then I found out there are a lot of cats, a lot of different species in nature. And the more I, the more I looked into it, the more interested I got. Uh, and then of course, the importance of conserving uh, these cats in nature. So I have to ask, what's your favorite wild cat and why? Well, that's really a tough question because I love all 40 species. It's kind of asking, you know, which is your favorite child? Uh, but one I will uh, point out uh, that I have a, a special uh, bond with uh, is the Marguerite, uh, but also the Clouded Leopard. They're both aberral, meaning they're tree loving, and uh, they live in the trees. And they, they've learned to climb down trees head first uh, because their, their uh, back paws have been adapted to by evolution to turn around 180 degrees and allow them to hang on. So they're like monkey cats. Um, and uh, I think, just think that's very cool what, uh, what evolution has uh, given these two species. That's great. Um, so you're, you're a cat enthusiast, but your, your background is very different from, from being involved with Panthera. So um, I, I wanna get a little bit into that. Um, in 2019, you suffered a tragic cycling accident that left left you without your use of your arms and legs. How are you doing now? And how did that tragedy influence your decision to step down from your leadership role at IDEX Laboratories and get more involved with uh, cat conservation? Well, I started to be involved with cat conservation even when I was uh, CEO of IDEX, but I didn't have that much time. And I, I started my relationship with Panthera, but, but as a result of the accident, I realized I, um, really wasn't going to be in a great position to continue the uh, the role as a CEO. So as they say, I stepped down since I actually don't do any stepping. Uh, I like to say I kind of rolled off or now I'm a chairman of a different kind. So then, you know, I said, OK, what do I do now? I mean, what's my purpose? Uh, and I realized uh, that it was time to give back, that I'd spent my entire career in business and had been extraordinarily successful. Uh, but now is the time to, um, to give back, uh, to, to use some of the financial uh, you know, uh, benefits that I had received as a result of being in business and um, pursue this really, really important goal of conserving species and in particular uh, cats, because I just think they're a very, very important part of uh, the biodiverse ecosystems in which they inhabit. Um, and so on that, on that front, um, you recently announced a $20 million commitment over the next 10 years to Panthera's Global Alliance for Wild Cats. Uh, what is the aim of that program? I wanted to dedicate that uh, primarily to uh, the 33 species of what we call small cats, as opposed to the seven species of big cats that have gotten really 99% of all the conservation attention. And um, I just felt that these small cats were also very important parts of their ecosystems. They were also under threat. In many cases, we know very, very little about them. Um, they're cute. They look like cousins of our domestic companions. And I think they're really important to, to conserve. First step, in many cases, is just to learn what their threats are. And they're probably, most of them are declining in numbers, but, but we need to understand that so that we can have effective conservation strategies. Um, so beyond just um, your generous financial support, um, you've had this incredibly successful career in the private sector, uh, you know, working in business, and you oversaw this incredible period of strat uh, stratospheric growth when you're at IDEX. So 
how are you applying that business acumen to your philanthropic efforts just beyond just, uh, you know, making generous donations? Yeah, thank you uh, for that question and for those compliments. In fact, I actually think that's just as important as the financial contribution because we need all the leadership uh, capability we can muster to um, solve these very, very challenging uh, conservation objectives. And I'm, I'm a good strategist. I'm good at figuring things out. And, uh, you know, I really learned that uh, I can add a lot of value in partnership with people who dedicate their lives to conservation. We, between us, we can put together effective strategies and, and then, then uh, the professionals are really good at executing them. So um, those skills, they're, they're, they're very transferable once you start to understand, you know, what an NGO is all about and, uh, you know, its purpose. Uh, so, it, you know, it's not perfectly transferable, but I'm good at figuring things out. That's what I've done all my life. And there are obviously a lot of conservation organizations out there. Uh, why did you choose Panthera? Well, Panthera is just absolutely a perfect match. I love cats. Uh, and so, uh, and then cats are really, really important. So Panthera is unique because that's all Panthera does is, is species conservation of the 40 species of, of cats, of Felidae. And uh, so this is like, I didn't really want to get involved in other areas. I wanted to focus on cats. Now cats are really critical members of the ecosystem. They're apex predators or they're near the top of the food chain. And by conserving cats, you're conserving these biodiverse uh, landscapes around the world. And most biodiverse landscapes on the five major continents have cats as part of their ecosystems. And so by conserving cats, we know we're doing a large part of conserving the biodiversity of these really, really incredible and, uh, and diminishing in size ecosystems. So that's really why we've got a, we have an urgency in front of us uh, before we lose them and, and lose some of these species. Fortunately, we haven't lost any, uh, any cat species so far, but some have come close. Uh, and so getting back to the Panthera specifically, so um, are there certain elements like in, in Panthera's leadership that, that inspires you or may distinguish it from other conservation organizations? Yeah, first of all, um, you know, my huge kudos to Tom Kaplan for having conceived uh, of an organization that's focused on cats. Um, I think that was a brilliant insight. And then he spent the last 15 years uh, building uh, Panthera. And we have an amazing CEO in uh, Fred Lune, who is, um, he, he totally gets it. And I think what, it, what makes Panthera unique is that Panthera, it's not just about Panthera. Panthera has a vision here, which I share, uh, of leading and coordinating and collaborating across the several major and many smaller NGOs, which do focus in part on cat conservation. I think if we work together, we can achieve more than if we work individually. That's not human nature. Most organizations, they want to build their own capability, but uh, Fred uh, and the leadership team uh, and, and the board and, and Tom and myself, we all share a vision that first and foremost, it's about the cats. It's not about us. We're here for the cats. So how can we, you know, have the greatest impact? And one of the ways we can have the greatest impact is provide cat leadership among multiple NGOs that are willing to collaborate to draw more attention uh, and more focus and more capability and uh, more synergy in our conservation efforts. So leadership is something which is often identified as a gap in the conservation space generally. And obviously you coming from a leadership role in, in the private sector, it seems like you could bring a lot to that, to that um, conversation. So just curious as to whether you know, you see opportunities to sort of leverage that knowledge. I mean, we've talked about this a little bit, but sp focusing specifically on the leadership and, and sort of these relationships that, you know, be, could be built through, through Panthera as well. 
Well, you know, you mentioned leadership as a gap in conservation organizations. Leadership is a gap, generally speaking. I knew leadership is a gap in uh, even in business. People who have the right combination of strategic skills, people skills, requisite knowledge of their space, um, and the ability to get things done, that's rare. You know, and in my experience, you, you have a lot of people in leadership positions that really don't have all those pieces. And so uh, that's true in any endeavor. Uh, and so, but when you have that kind of leadership, and it's usually a collaborative leadership, you can accomplish 10 times what you might have accomplished otherwise with some gaps. And, you know, if I look at, at my prior company, IDEX, where I was CEO for uh, 17 years, you know, the stock price is almost 100 times what it was when I joined. Well, maybe without as good a leadership, it'd be 10 times, uh, which still be really good returns, but it's 100 times. This is what I'm talking about. Really good leadership can have a huge impact on uh, the effectiveness of an organization achieving its purpose. And what better area to focus on than species conservation and cats as key players in these ecosystems, apex predators, indicator species, um, to apply that those leadership skills. Um, so wildlife conservation is inherently as much about people as it is about animals. So what are the, some of the strategies that um, the Ayers Wildcat Conservation Trust, which is your own entity, and Panthera are undertaking to strengthen and support local communities in and around cat habitats? Yes, this is a really important observation, a really important question, uh, because conservation is just not science, it's social science. Um, because we have to find ways for humans and these biodiverse landscapes and cats to coexist. Now, it turns out these biodiverse landscapes have a lot of uh, benefit to humans. They provide a lot of ecosystem services. The most obvious one is, is tourism. But there are a lot of other ecosystem uh, services that come when you have a balanced uh, ecosystem with, you know, apex predators at the top of the food chain. And so um, this is, uh, th this is, you got you to gotta have to bring the people along, no question about it. Now, different regions and different species, these challenges manifest themselves uh, differently. Uh, but Panthera is very, very dedicated to working with um, uh, people who are adjacent to or local to um, these biodiverse areas, protected areas in Africa, uh, the Brazilian rainforest. Uh, there are just many, many examples where working with the local people is, is critical to success. You can't do it otherwise. And so beyond habitat loss and killing due to the perceived threats against wildlife, wildcats are often targeted by poachers for their skins and other parts. Um, do you have thoughts on ways to address that issue? Yeah, that's a, that's a big threat, particularly with the, uh, uh, with the big cats. Um, and uh, first of all, you have to have the right, um, you know, the right governance in place. Um, many places do, but they don't, they're not effective in, in um, you know, in securing uh, those uh, spaces. And then, you know, poachers, sometimes poachers come from out of the area. Many times they come from other places. And, um, but there are very effective strategies uh, to countering the poachers. Uh, and uh, it's really just a matter of, of resources, leadership, and building the talent and capability uh, to do that. It's proven, and I, uh, Panthera has proven it, other NGOs have proven it, um, and uh, it's, it's a very critical part, particularly for big cat conservation but sometimes for small cat conservation. So I want to take a step back and talk about conservation more broadly. Um, are there gaps that you see in conservation generally? Um, or put another way, are there, what are some of the things that the conservation sector needs to do better in order to make itself more appealing or more relevant to the general public? Yeah, that's uh, clearly uh, species conservation and conserving the remaining biodiversity that we have on the planet is way underfunded. Uh, and um, it's very tangible. We can measure the impact of conservation. There's no doubt 
uh, that uh, you know species numbers in particular areas declining or under threat or in some cases have gone extinct. Uh, these are measurable. Uh, and once these are gone, they're not coming back. You know, we'll, we'll have a dead planet. And so we have to find uh, ways to live uh, with nature. Nature is important to our existence as humans. And, uh, you know, we can maybe solve a climate change problem or not, but with a dead planet, what do we have? So um, I do believe that um, conservation, species conservation is under recognized its importance. Uh, and I, that's one of the re reasons why I'm so passionate uh, about working on this, not just through Panthera, but more broadly to bring attention. And we know when we bring attention, people say, yeah, that's important. And they will, they will allocate some of the funding uh, to, uh, to species conservation. And here's the thing. Cats are really charismatic, including small cats. They look like a cousin of your house cat. And they say, oh, that looks like, you know, my, my kitty, uh, just a cousin. And they are cousins, you know, because they're in the same family. Uh, and once they have an appreciation, they go, oh, yeah, these, we don't want these to go away in nature. Um, but we need to bring attention to it. And I think it's about bringing attention and inspiring people to say, this is important too. So, I mean, to pick you up on that point, um, there's sort of like the, the charisma of, of, of cats, but um, when it comes to environmental issues, um, something like climate change feels like it's easier to place a value on it. Cause you can say like, you know, there's gonna be this much economic damage from, from climate change. Whereas biodiversity, it's a little bit fuzzier to sort of quantify and sort of factor into economic decision making. So given your background in business, do you have ideas on how we may be able to improve sort of the economic argument for wildlife conservation and with, you know, with the goal of persuading more governments and, and companies to factor animal well-being into, uh, into their decision making? Well, I think that's a great question. And I am a, a trained economist. Uh, and I, I understand that. I would counter by saying the one thing about species conservation and conserving biodiversity is that we have much more tangible measures on our impact than we can have with climate change. And it's just as important. But beyond that, these, these ecosystems, which these cabots, cats inhabit, have tremendous ecosystem services to the humans that live near them. I mean, the most obvious example is ecotourism. And, uh, you know, much of, of Africa's economy is devoted to ecotourism. It took a hit during COVID, but it'll come back and I think it'll grow. But there are other reasons why um, this biodiverse, when you, when you lose an apex predator or, a, a, you know, an important piece near the top of the food chain, Everything goes out of whack and all of a sudden you got too many rodents or too many this or that, that all of a sudden have to be addressed some other way, which costs money. So uh, this is, uh, it's, it's important that we live in, in balance with nature as it, as it came to us. And, uh, and then there's just the psychological gratification of, um, of having these species, these very charismatic species, which are the protectors you know, these are the protectors of these ecosystems. And so what we're doing is we're protecting the protectors. And by protecting the protectors, we're protecting ourselves uh, from the loss of these important ecosystem services. So, I mean, on that front, and we've touched on this a little bit, but um, do you have thoughts on how to scale up philanthropic support for conservation efforts? I mean, both like cat conservation efforts, but just broadly nature conservation since it's since it represents such a small proportion of philanthropic giving these days? Well, that's what I plan to devote my attention to and what Panthera's uh, board and, uh, and management uh, plan to devote uh, their attention to. I think there is tremendous opportunity because conservation, a species conservation receives such a tiny, tiny amount of total nature conservation or even philanthropy, broadly speaking, I think it's a matter of bringing attention to the right uh, to the right people, whether they're uh, private funders or government funders. 
um, that, hey, this is important too. I do think in general, we are an environment uh, in the world where people have a greater appreciation for, for uh, nature and, and for the importance of our planet. I think we have a growing pie and I think we can grow the pie further by saying, hey, biodiversity is important too and we know how to do this. Then the next constraint is building the talent base and that's about not just leadership but people on the ground. Those people on the ground really are best um, if, if we can be people who are local to these, uh, you know, to these uh, biodiverse landscapes. Um, in other words, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're part of their community, they're part of their country. And we need to build that talent base. That takes time. I know how to grow things. You know, I grew the, the company I was with, uh, you know, over, over a two decade period, uh, many, many fold. This is about growing things. So you build the funding base, you build the talent base, you have tangible results. Panthera with its scientific approach can demonstrate tangible results from these investments. Uh, and um, success begets success is what I have found. When people say, oh, that is really exciting and that's achieving results, I want to, you know, I want to help that. I want to contribute to that. I want to devote some of the funds that we're devoting to saving the planet to, uh, to biodiversity. I know that's achievable and I'm convinced that I will be part of the growing uh, chorus that is singing uh, the importance of that uh, objective. So John, you mentioned that you have always been a fan of cats and you're uh, you've become more recently a fan of wildcats. So there are over 43 million households in the U.S. Uh, with domestic cats. Um, why should pet owners care about what happens to wild cats? Well, you bring up a great point. And of course, uh, the domestic cat was my background. About 40% of uh, U.S. households do have a, a cat as a pet. And most of them consider them members of the family. Uh, if I take my daughter as an example, I showed her the flat-headed cat, which is one of the 33 species of small cats. And she goes, that looks like my potato, so, um, which is the name of her cat. So um, I, I think that uh, people who love cats, uh, and not everybody does, because cats are hard to understand. They're not like dogs, okay? They're their own independent, and it does take some, I think it just takes a special person to understand the cat. But when they do understand cats, and they love them for what they are, an amazing evolutionary marvel, then I think it's not a very long step to understanding that wildcats are cousins and are also uh, amazing creatures, amazing uh, products of evolution. You know, if you think about it, cats go back six million years and many of these species were created before the ice age began, which is over about the last 2.6 million years. So these cats, have really survived a lot of different uh, evolution of the of the Earth's uh, climate history, uh, while many other species have come and gone, and so they really are perfect um, evolutionary creatures. And when you when you appreciate that, you you come to the conclusion it would be a real shame to wipe them all out in a couple hundred years after they've survived you know three to six million years. So um, I think the I, th I think cats have the ability to bring special attention to uh, conservation of, of biodiversity. You come from a career in the veterinary industry. Um, what do you think veterinarians and those in this industry have to offer wildcat conservation? Well, first of all, I think they can help bring attention there. They, they went into the veterinary world because they love animals. And many veterinarians, um, their love of animals may have come from visiting the zoo and seeing the wildcats in the zoo. And so, and many veterinarians, when they dream to be a veterinarian, you know, when they're a kid, uh, they, they say, I want to be a wild, uh, you know, a wild animal veterinarian. And of course, there are very few jobs in that area. So they go into, you know, where the jobs are, which is, which is for the most part, a uh, companion animal, dogs and cats. But they still have that interest. Uh, many of them do. And so 
um, they can bring attention, uh, they can bring financial resources, um, you know, they can be uh, involved in a number of different ways. Uh, and I think they're a very special audience uh, for the pitch we're making for, uh, uh, for biodiversity and species conservation because we're talking about cats. Shifting gears a bit, um, so environmental issues are often very depressing and a lot of people sort of struggle with sort of the, the degree of problems facing the world. And um, you know, so for that reason, I mean, your ability to rebound after such a tragic accident can be, is inspiring, I think could be inspiring to other people. So is there any advice you'd give someone who's trying to persevere through such a traumatic experience? Well, first of all, I think we just have to recognize it's hard, okay? When you have so much taken away from you, you know, it's hard, it's hard to readjust and it's a process. Uh, and, um, but if you can create and carve out a new life um, from, uh, from the remaining assets that you have, um, that can give you purpose for, for persevering on. And, um, and I think that's really the part process of the transition. Uh, that goes through when somebody goes through a traumatic um, health uh, change in, the, in their life. And it, it does not just, you know, uh, paralysis, spinal cord injury, but, you know, there are many others. Uh, the point is here that I still have a brain. I didn't have any brain injury with my accident. I'm not dead. Uh, I have my talents. Maybe I can't do 20,000 things, but I can do 2,000 things. And let's focus on those 2,000 things and... And one of the things I can do is bring my talents to this important cause, which gives me purpose along with my family. This is what gives me purpose to, to work through the, uh, the health challenges I have with this condition. What would you say to a person, especially a young person, who's uh, concerned or disappointed about sort of the direction of, 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 of issues when it comes to the environment and climate and biodiversity? I think we can only try. We have to do what we can do. The more people we can recruit to this, uh, and we're talking about living in harmony with nature. We're talking about the benefits that nature brings us, whether it's just going out and being part of nature, which many people have done through this COVID era, or the ecosystem, ecosystem services that nature um, uh, uh, brings to the human race and allows us to be who we are. Um, this is uh, this is important. So, yes, these challenges are rather overwhelming. You know, if you look at the wild lion population in Africa, this is a very important species. This is an indicator species. They're the king of the jungle. They're the top of the food chain. We have half the number of wild lions today uh, at the time of the second Lion King than we did at the time of the first Lion King. And so um, it's challenging, but I believe we can change the direction, um, but we have to try. We have to be focused on it. We have to allocate um, our resources and our attention to it. And so uh, I think this is where young people can, can have an impact. I think young people are even more in tune with the importance of the environment. Uh, and as they appreciate the importance of biodiversity, uh, they can play an important role. So would you say that you're encouraged by young generations level of concern for the environment? I am. I'm also encouraged by their love of animals. I mean, it's already been proven that um, millennials are much more attached to their pets than, than baby boomers were, and baby boomers were pretty attached. Uh, and, uh, and then the Generation Z is even more than millennials. This has been proven out. This is why the uh, the companion animal space has grown so much in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, but that's, that's not, as I said, it's not a long step from that to understand the importance of these same animals in the wild. Uh, and I do see a growing uh, interest in uh, nature. Um, and so, and I think we're getting better at it. We've learned a lot just in the last 10 or 20 years about conservation. Uh, and let's just take Africa. Africa's already set aside these, uh, uh, you know, these, these biodiverse landscapes um, as protected areas or communication uh, conservation uh, areas. But we don't have the resources. We know how to do it. We're learning how to do it. We're getting better every day. 
we're applying technology, we're applying um, new camera track and new geospatial uh, technologies. We know how to control poaching. Um, we, we are learning more about these species. And so uh, as we become more productive, that means the investment we put in it has greater impact. So I am very, I am very optimistic that we can turn the tide. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take decades, but we can turn the tide so that we preserve the remaining biodiversity that we have on this planet. Uh, you mentioned uh, the role that veterinarians could play in helping cat conservation. Um, explain that a little bit. What role can successful businesses like your former employers, IDEX and Carrier play in conserving wildlife and preserving nature? Yeah, I think uh, I think business uh, they're they're looking for uh, places to uh, um, you know as part of their uh, part of their brand, if you will. Uh, and many many um, businesses, uh, the jewelers uh, and uh, and clothing companies are attaching themselves to uh, social causes. Just think of the number of brands that are named after cats, the number of sports teams that are named after cats. The number of mos mascots that are named after cats, the number of automobiles that are named after cats. This is, um, you know, this th there's there's I think there's a lot of potential here. Uh, unfortunately, these cats don't get a royalty on their name, but you know I think we I think they deserve some of the attention if we're gonna, you know, get the benefit of uh, of their names and in, in in the branding. Who would be your top? get in terms of a partner, like a corporate partner or, um, you know, a brand uh, for your efforts with, with Panthera? Um, we've actually already had uh, success uh, with um, not just Panthera, but other, other conservation organizations with places like Christie's and Sotheby's, you know, these high-end um, high uh, consumer brands, um, fashion brands, um, these have already proven uh, to be uh, great part, great business partners. Uh, I think it's our role to expand that, to say, hey, this will help your brand. Um, this will help, you know, your uh, impression with your customers and clients. Uh, if you are attaching yourself to a tangible and charismatic social cause. And, you know, there's a lot of species out there and a lot of species conservation but I would say that one of the most charismatic set of species are the wildcats, starting with the tigers and the lions and the jaguars. Those are the top three. And, and you know, these are very, very charismatic species. Uh, and, um, and they can be used to bring attention, financial resources and talent to uh, species conservation and biodiversity conversa uh, conservation writ large. When it comes to wildcat conservation, most of the attention and dollars go to the great cats. So lions, tigers, cheetah, maybe jaguars. What's the pitch for small cats? Now, that's true. Actually, historically, 99% of the very small amount of funding that does go to cat conservation uh, goes to the uh, seven large cats or even a smaller number. You mentioned uh, tigers, lions, uh, jaguars. Those are probably the top three. Uh, and while not enough attention and funding is even going to those, you know, 1% is going to 33 species of small cats, which are all over, all over the world. Uh, but these, these are important parts of the ecosystem too, just because they aren't visible, just because they make themselves scarce and they're really good at hiding. Just imagine, you know, getting your own cat from under the bed when you want to go to the vet. Okay, these cats are really good at hiding. And the reason they're really good at hiding is because they're not only predators, well, they're all obligate carnivores. Of course, they're predators. That's what cats are. But in the small cats, they're also prey. Um, so their meso predator, their meso predators are near the top of the food chain, but not the top of the food chain. Particularly their uh, their their cubs and kittens. So um, uh, so they just don't get the attention that the big cats do. But when you bring attention to it, just show a couple of videos of these cats in the wild. Show a video of a margay swinging from branch to branch, uh, taking care of her, of her kitten. I mean, these are like incredible 
Uh, and, they, and, and you say to yourself, this is what we're talking about. This is what we need to preserve. We want them more than just in the zoo. We want them in their natural habitat. So I think when we bring attention, we have just the same opportunity uh, for charismatic connection as we do with what have been for eons, the big icon, big cats. Have you seen cats in the wild? You know, I've seen one cat in the wild. Um, I, I was uh, cycling in a rural part of Maine and a bobcat ran across the road um, about 100 yards ahead of me. First, I didn't even know what it was, but my fellow cyclist said that was not a deer. Uh, and then we realized that it was a, it was a bobcat. Now with my condition uh, and the diffi extreme difficulty I have with traveling, um, you know, it's just not gonna be possible, but I'm really, really good at visualizing things. And I'm really good at understanding things from an intellectual point of view. So um, it may sound odd. Well, you've never seen anything in the wild and you haven't done any of this conservation. Well, I think I can bring a lot to the equation um, without having done that. And unfortunately, it's just not gonna be part of my experience going forward. Like many, many things I've had to let go. You know, I'm just, I just have to let it go and say, I can, I can, I can focus on what I can do. Technology is increasingly a, an important uh, tool in sort of the conservationist tool belt. Um, so that ranges from monitoring of habitat to fighting poaching. Um, can you tell us a bit about um, Panthera's efforts on, on the technology front and uh, you know, what, what are some of these innovative tools that are being used to conserve wildcats? Oh, the, 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 the technology runs the gamut. Uh, where, where Panthera is really focused is um, a couple of areas. One is camera trap technology that captures cats. And let me just give you an example. Historically, we developed really good camera traps for big cats. Well, guess what? We don't see the small cats because they go right under the camera. You know, they're, they're at the wrong level. Um, so we've learned um, how to do small cat. Small cats are harder to collar and track than big cats because they're smaller. But technology is getting to that point where we can do that. Um, but also the databases. We are actually collecting a lot of information, but we need to put it into a coherent database that's shared across conservation organizations. This is a huge technology challenge uh, and one which uh, Panthera is leading with what we call Panthera IDS. And, you know, we just are data deficient in so many of these species. We don't even know what their real territories are. We don't know to what degree their numbers are declining. Um, and without that kind of information, it's really hard to see what the effectiveness of conservation strategies are. So uh, we're working on um, the database technology. But there are other technologies. You know, one of the things that has been a huge change is, um, is uh, molecular uh, analysis of the uh, genome. And so, for example, we say there are 40 species of wildcats. We don't know that for sure. We're still working on it. There are probably a couple of more species that we've lumped together, but are actually, we can prove through uh, molecular analysis of the genome that are in fact um, different species. Uh, and uh, you know, an example is the, uh, is the tiger cat in uh, Central and South America. We, we believe that the cat in Central America is probably a different species than the one in Northern South America. Um, just because of the geographic separation. Well, we've lumped those together, but you know, we're on the verge of, of adding a 41st or maybe even a 42nd species. So this is how little we know, but this is um, the, the, the genetic analysis gave great clarity over the last 20 years to um, the, uh, the family tree of cats. And cats we thought were related to each other turned out weren't at all related to each other. And the reason we thought they were was because they looked similar. The morphology was the same. But it turned out they weren't even related. They were part of different genuses uh, and part of, different part, of, uh, part of different lineages. Who knew that the puma uh, and the cheetah were closely related? But they are, they're part of the same lineage. Um, but, you know, they, they look pretty different. Um, so genetic analysis has been a huge, huge uh, tool 
uh, that we've used uh, to help understand uh, cat biology and therefore give us effective conservation strategies. Uh, is Panthera doing anything with environmental DNA? Uh, we are actually. Um, so, uh, you know, when a cat poops, uh, we call that scat. And so we can, uh, we can, we can look at the presence uh, of cats without even capturing the cat uh, and uh, just looking at the scat. And so we have some projects in that area. Some cats are really hard to find, especially the small cats. The black-footed cat is the most vicious hunter and it weighs about five pounds, okay? It's, the, it's, it's got the highest success rate of hunting, but you can't find them, but you can find their scat. So, uh, yeah, so, um, and there are other examples of environmental DNA um, that, uh, that we use to um, find presence and, uh, and track, uh, track the numbers. Rhett, I wanted to say, you know, from this technology point of view, uh, whether we're talking about databases or we're talking about, you know, molecular genetics, this is an area I'm very comfortable in because IDEX was a technology company. IDEX prides itself on being the technology innovator in diagnostics. And so I've got a strong background in the, uh, you know, in the biology and the, and the, uh, the diagnostic side, uh, which is, I think, uh, uh, gives me some background that I can transfer over to uh, the technology of, uh, of conservation. And not to mention all the database challenges. You know, every company has challenges in growing their, their IT uh, or technology, uh, information technology footprint. Uh, and, and IDEX was a leader in that area in their space. And so these do bring general skills that I can support Panthera and overall conservation efforts. So on the technology front, there's some of the technologies like say like monitoring cats. Monitoring cats is very hard. Um, do you see, are, are there like critical technologies that would allow that sort of functionality to go to scale? So in order to do monitoring of, of cats across a much larger area, for example, like, is that something you think about? Oh yeah, uh, this is critical to uh, objective measurements of our conservation success. Now we've gotten pretty good at monitoring big cats, tigers and lions. Um, we're really good at that. Uh, and in general, um, conservation has come really good at, at monitoring big cats. And um, so that's why the lion is such a special species for uh, determining the health of these protected areas in Africa. We can, we can measure by looking at just the lion count. Because of their lions, we know there's a whole ecosystem, lion being, of course, the top of the food chain, the king of the jungle. Doesn't have to worry, it doesn't have any natural predators, just, just man is its, is its predator and, and, and not having enough, uh, you know, not having enough pre uh, prey. But um, by measuring the lions, and we can measure the lion counts, this is, we know how to do this. This is now relatively straightforward. We've come down the learning curve on that. We can use the lions as an indicator species to the overall health of these, uh, of these uh, protected areas. Now, most of these protected areas, while they're set aside by their governments, are, are declining or failing. And we know that because we know about the lion counts. And so not only is lion an incredibly charismatic species, it's also a really helpful species for, for objectively measuring, not just saying, oh, you know, we're doing a good job in this area, but actually counting lions. Now, how do we do that with smaller species? Well, we've got to learn how to do that. That's, uh, that's more challenging than the really big cats. I recently read an article about the Furs for Life program. Um, what is that? Well, that's a, a Panthera success story. Uh, when we were looking at the leopard and we were looking at the threats on the leopard, we, we uh, realized that a local religious group was, uh, had an important part of their culture uh, leopard skins uh, and the wearing of leopard skins. And so they were actually killing leopards in order to get the leopard skins for their, uh, for their religious ceremonies. And um, so when we went to this group and we indicated that it was resulting in drastically declining populations of, of leopards around them, uh, and then we also provided them an alternative, a synthetic um, uh, leopard skin that looked just like, couldn't tell the difference between that and a real uh, leopard skin. 
um, as a way to continue their, uh, their custom, then uh, we were successful in convincing them and we eliminated an important threat to a declining leopard population uh, in the wild. And they appreciated that actually leopards were important. They were part of their culture and you know, they wanted leopards to continue uh, in, the, uh, you know, in the wild. We've touched on ecotourism, uh, but I wanted to see whether you envisioned other economic opportunities around uh, cat conservation. Yeah, I, uh, ecotourism is a big one, but it's also vulnerable, uh, as we've learned over the last uh, year, year and a half. Um, there are uh, other tremendous benefits to, uh, uh, to preserving our, our biodiversity. Uh, and um, you know, there are many examples where when you um, eliminate part of the food chain, uh, then another part of the, the food chain becomes overabundant and starts destroying uh, uh, parts of the, and puts everything out of the whack. And then that can, that can then uh, impact the humans that live in that area. So um, it's important to keep nature in balance. And by keeping nature in balance, we keep ourselves in balance. Um, so Jonathan, what's your vision for Panthera? Yeah, I, I think Panthera has a, a great role to play in, um, in preserving the protected areas and the, bio, the remaining biodiversity uh, that we have in the world. It's going to take time for us to really come to, uh, uh, to harmony with nature where biodiversity is preserved. This may take 100 years uh, to, uh, for us to mature uh, ourselves and the strategies and the appreciation for what nature, uh, the importance of nature to the human species. But I think we are well on that way to, to that journey. And Panthera, with its focus on the charismatic cats, I think can play a big role in rallying people around the importance of nature, the importance of biodiversity, and the importance of conservation of the remaining biodiversity. You know, over the last 100, 200 years, or 300 years in the case of, of some places, we've wiped out a lot of biodiversity by either expanding uh, uh, livestock or uh, by uh, turning you know, wilds into, uh, into farmland. But I think we're getting better at it now. I think we're better appreciating how we can uh, peacefully coexist and appreciate and, and retain the, the benefits of biodiversity and their ecosystem services. I know that your focus, your new focus at Panthera is small cats but I wanted to ask whether you have a favorite big cat program uh, at Panthera. Well, um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk about small cats to the exclusion of big cats because big cats are also really, really important and most of them are um, facing significant threats and declining in numbers in the wild. You know, starting first uh, you know, with the tiger, although we've stabilized many regions of the tiger, but if they're much, much, much smaller levels than they were you know, many, many years ago, 50, 100 years ago. Uh, and so um, the big cats, and there, there are seven of them, including tigers, lions, and jaguars. Of course, I love them all. But the one that I've really devoted a lot of time to, the two actually, uh, are the lions in Africa because they are such an indicator species. We can count lions. By counting lions, we can count the health of a, of a protected area. Uh, and of course, lions are just very, very cool. Uh, and then the other um, species that I've gotten taken and a particular interest in is the other lion, the mountain lion. And the mountain lion has the biggest range in North America. It's across from Canada all the way to the uh, tip of Patagonia. And um, the mountain lion is persecuted for all sorts of reasons. And yet we've already demonstrated that the mountain lion uh, brings tremendous ecosystem um, service benefit uh, to uh, you know, in, in, into the, uh, the biodiverse landscapes in which they inhabit. Uh, and so uh, I think we have a lot of opportunity here. Uh, the mountain lion is not particularly threatened, but this is the time that you focus on conservation. You don't want to focus when there are only a few left, uh, although there are only a few left uh, here in Florida where I live. Uh, the, the mountain lion is also called the puma. It's called the panther, it's called the cougar, it's catamount. It's got more names than any other cat, uh, but they're all the same species. And we have about 100 
Florida Panthers left in the uh, in the Everglades with just about the minimum amount amount uh, to preserve uh, enough um, genetic diversity um, that that subspecies will continue to survive. But it's important that we focus on this so we're not left with uh, you know uh, danger of extinction 50 years down the road. What else do you want the general public to know about Panthera? Well, I, I think just understanding the importance of preserving these, uh, these, uh, the biodiversity we have, the importance that cats play in that, um, being um, apex or meso uh, predators and umbrella species and indicator species, uh, and that these species exist. Most people, you know, many people and, and, and my friends in the animal health space, I tell them I'm working on a wildcat conservation and they go, well, oh, you mean you're working on like feral cats? And I go, no, 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 those are domestic cats that have re-entered the wild again. No, I'm not talking about feral cats, important area, but no, I'm not talking. Oh, you mean you're talking about the ones in the zoo, right? The ones I see in, well, no, actually I'm not talking about those. Those are wild cats, but they're in the zoos. I'm talking about the wild cats that are in the wild. Oh, I guess there are, I guess that's where tigers came from. They came from, you mean there's still tigers in the wild? Yeah, I said there are about 4,000 tigers in the wild and we need to, we need to conserve them because that's, that's where they're supposed to be. And, you know, as you start this conversation, they get more and more interested. And so, you know, one of my, one of my visions or one of the things I'd love people to appreciate for Panthera is that we're working on a really important area uh, of, of, you know, saving our planet that people don't have a full appreciation to until they're given the opportunity to dive into it. Uh, where can people go to learn more about Panthera and its work? Well, we have a, a great uh, website, panthera.org, and, um, and it's got really all the programs that we're working on. Uh, and, um, you know, Panthera is a growing organization. We'll probably uh, grow our revenues about 25%. Uh, this year over last. Uh, we're really grateful for the support that we receive from, uh, from many sources. Uh, and, you know, I think it's interesting. Um, what is Panthera? What does the name Panthera mean? Maybe people don't even understand that. So you've got the cat family, the Felidae, and then there are different genuses, meaning sub parts of the family. And then there are species, I'm simplifying the taxonomy, taxonomy somewhat, but there are species within the genuses. Uh, and one of the genuses is the Panthera uh, genus. And there are seven cats in the Panthera genus. And these are the five big cats, lions, tigers, jaguars, leopards, and snow leopards. And they are all distinguished because they roar. They can't purr, they roar. And all the other cats, they can purr, but they can't roar, just the way they evolved. Then there are two other um, species as part of Panthera called the cloud leopard. They're smaller, they're considered small cats, but they're part of Panthera. So Panthera was initially named after uh, these uh, big cats. Uh, and then the other big cats that people normally think of are mountain lions and, uh, and cheetahs. Um, they're just not part of the Panthera genus. And then, um, uh, and then of course, there are all the, the, the 33 species of, of small cats. So, that's what Panthera does. You know, we do cat, wild cat conservation. That's our focus. Um, there are many similarities across these 40 species of wild cats, uh, and that give us an understanding of the biology and, uh, and some of the challenges uh, of the threats they face. You're a member of the Global Alliance. Uh, what is that? So this is uh, the inspiration of Tom Kaplan, the founder of uh, Panthera and also the founder of the Global Alliance. His vision was he wanted to get a group of people who were willing to commit $20 million over 10 years to wildcat conservation. Maybe through Panthera, maybe through other ways. It was just a commitment to wildcat conservation because, you know, that was, that was Tom's goal in, in founding Panthera was wildcat conservation. But if it happens to happen some other area, we're still working on wildcat conservation. So, um, so I'm the sixth member uh, of the Global Alliance who've made a public commitment to um, invest 20 million over the next 10 years in uh, wildcat conservation. Now that 20 million will be through Panthera. Um, now I do support other wildcat conservation efforts beyond Panthera, 
But my commitment uh, for this 20 million is, is through Panthera. And this 20 million is also primarily directed at funding the uh, small cap program at Panthera, which we've really grown uh, to a real program over the last couple of years. I to totally changing the topic here. Why should a family in a place like Ohio care about the future of a tiger? Well, first of all, um, tigers are meant to be in the wild uh, and they're not, they're not pets. You know, sometimes these, these, these cubs are very, very cute, but when they grow up, they're very, very, very dangerous. So really, if you like tigers and maybe you're, you know, the mascot of your local high school sports team is the tiger. Uh, wouldn't it be a shame if tigers didn't exist in the wild anymore? And yet we glorify them. So I think the importance of maintaining tigers in the wild is important to our very being, our very identity, given that we have attached our identity, rightly so, to these amazing creatures of nature. Well, thank you, Jonathan, uh, for your time today. It was, it was very interesting. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, you guys do good. Great work, and it's a pleasure to be part of it. All right, thanks again, and take care.